The U.S. imposes ballistic missile sanctions on Iran a day after the nuclear deal is implemented, as Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu warns that Tehran is still pursuing atomic weapons and aims to destabilize the Middle East. Islamic State reportedly takes more than 400 civilians hostage when it attacks the Syrian city of Deir el-Zur. Some 300 others, including women and children, are believed massacred. And Pope Francis becomes the third Catholic leader to visit Rome's main synagogue. It comes as Jerusalem's Dormition Abbey Church is vandalized in a suspected hate crime. Thank you for staying with us. Israel's foreign ministry is making last-ditch efforts to block a pending EU resolution that emphasizes the distinction between Israel proper and territories captured during 1967. According to officials, adoption of the resolution could lead to new sanctions against Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Eli Hochenberg has more. I think uh, we have to uh, reset our relationship with the EU and set things on the right course. The EU and Israel have been on a rocky road for a while now, but only two months after the Union presented guidelines for labeling products from Israeli settlements, the pressure is rising even further. The EU's Foreign Affairs Council, consisting of European foreign ministers, is due to approve this Tuesday a proposal aimed at differentiating between areas on either sides of the 1967 borders, commonly known as the Green Line. The initiative basically calls on European nations to limit their engagement with Israel to the areas within the Green Line in light of Europe's growing frustration with the stalled peace process. The meaning of this distinction is clear, further strengthen the EU's position on the illegality of Israeli settlements. Our cooperation with the European states just about across the board uh, has been uh, uh, intensifying and growing as it is with other countries in the world. Here's the exception. The exception is not with the individual countries, by and large. It is, in fact, the multinational organizations like the UN or, unfortunately, like the EU. In response, the Israeli foreign ministry is once again entering emergency mode, distributing guidelines to Israeli ambassadors to Europe and working behind the scenes to thwart this bid. Chances, however, seem low at the moment. But in any case, this push signals that relations between Jerusalem and Brussels are not only deteriorating, but sinking fast. And I'm joined in the studio again by our diplomatic correspondent for the news today, Eli Hochenberg. Good evening, Good Eli. Good evening. Eli, of course, this is not the first time that the EU has announced such measures vis-a-vis -vis the settlements. It has been met with a lot of objection before, even accusations of hypocrisy, and not just from Israel. Absolutely. We're talking about, you know, the same uh, uh, voices as saying that Israel is being measured under a double standard, a different standard than the rest of the world. Namely, if we're talking about uh, uh, Western uh, diplomacies, uh, 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 democracies, of course. And the thing is that even within the, the European continent, the, the, the opinions towards Israel are not unanimous. Even now about this new bid, we hear that Greece is uh, objecting the harsh rhetoric used in this uh, new uh, proposal wanting to tone it down a bit and also add references to the terrorist uh, to the terrorism uh, threat that Israel is uh, is going uh, under but definitely the, the the biggest fear at the moment is that the relations between Israel and the EU and the EU will reach a point uh, uh, when things will be irreversible and nothing uh, will be uh, uh, it will not be possible to recover uh, the relations because at the moment the animosity and the and the tension between Brussels and Jerusalem Jerusalem is really reaching its uh, its peak, and this is the biggest fear at the moment uh, in Jerusalem. And of course, uh, part of the fear on the Israeli side is that um, making the distinction more clear between Israel and the settlements could lead to a ban on the entire country or an academia and commerce from within the green line. Well, listen, the uh, Euro Europe and Israel uh, has great trade relations. Uh, we're talking about uh, dozens of billions of uh, dollars every year, import and export uh, from Europe to Israel and uh, vice versa. So it will not all go to waste. There will be 
many things that will still be maintained, especially when we're talking about the relations of Israel and individual European countries. But such guidelines that are forced uh, are forcing themselves on European uh, nations can definitely boost the uh, BDS movements and all the uh, academic boycott uh, we're seeing uh, on Israel, especially when it comes to uh, uh, institutions uh, beyond uh, the uh, 1967 border. So it's definitely a rising threat. And uh, in Jerusalem, they're trying to combat that as for now without uh, significant success. Yes, Eli Hochenberg, again this evening. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. And we're continuing with the theme of a certain threat. Palestinian officials revealed today they had arrested a member of their peace negotiating department for spying for Israel. The man, whose name was not released, was reportedly an administrative staffer and not privy to classified information. Local media said he was arrested two weeks ago. And I'm joined for this more on this story by Mohammed Al Qasim, our correspondent and analyst. Good evening, Mohammed. Good evening. Mohammed, we know that there has been a denial since. You have more details on this complicated story for us. Well, I, so far, the denial is on the ranking of this uh, employee. The ranking is not, he is not the uh, someone close advisor to uh, Saeb Arakat, Dr. Arakat, who is the chief negotiation, negotiator with Israel on the uh, peace uh, negotiations. Now, according to the to an, a senior PLO official, that an employee of the Palestinian Liberation Organization Negotiation Affairs Department has been detained a couple of weeks ago in Ramallah after uh, spying or collaborating with Israel, according to this source, who said that this uh, person has been under surveillance for quite some time and he has been uh, providing Israeli authorities with uh, intelligence work and intelligence uh, information on uh, papers and documents that this office prepares uh, for the uh, PLO as well as the Palestinian Authority. Now, Dr. Arakat came out and said that this, uh, this employee is just an administrative uh, employee who did not have any sensitive information that will uh, uh, harm Palestinian uh, negotiation uh, stance. And tell us more about Arikat for our viewers who don't know. How much could, could this be damaging even for the process between uh, the Palestinians and Israel? Well, this isn't the first time that someone from the office of Dr. Arakat has been implicated in such a, a spying uh, affair. In 2011, in what was uh, labeled then Palestine paper scandal, someone leaked more than 1,600 uh, documents from his office to Al Jazeera News Network uh, basically talking about the methods and the concessions that the uh, office of uh, Dr. Arakat has made to the Israeli side without going back uh, either to the Palestinian people or to the PLO. So this could be damaging. Uh, let's just wait and see on the kind of information that this uh, person has given to the Israeli authorities before uh, such uh, judgment can be made. Hamad Al Qasim, thank you very much for always bringing us information that's not leaked and not illegal, but always confirmed and enlightening. Thank you. And Pope Francis visited Rome's main synagogue today, the latest move in a, co in a concrete effort to boost Catholic Jewish relations. It comes as Jerusalem's Dormition Abbey Church was vandalized in a suspected, quote, price tag attack. I 24 News correspondent Uri Shapira has more. Pope Francis paid a rare visit to Rome's Great Synagogue Sunday as tensions rise between the Jewish people and the Holy See. Under tight security, Pope Francis walked into the synagogue and met Italy's chief rabbi, Riccardo Di Senji. Jews and Christians must therefore feel like brothers united by the same God and by a rich common spiritual heritage. Francis is the third pope to visit Rome's great synagogue after John Paul II in 1986 and Benedict XVI in 2010. Last month, the Vatican issued a statement saying Catholics should not actively seek to convert Jews and must do all they can to repel anti-Semitic tendencies. And while Pope Francis is paying his respect to the Jewish community, another hate crime was perpetrated against Christians in Jerusalem. Anti-Christian graffiti was sprayed Sunday on a wall of the Dormition Abbey, saying kill the pagans and death to Christian unbelievers. This is the second attack in three years on the Abbey, where according to tradition, the Virgin Mary died. Um, yes, uh, we, make, uh, we, we, we took pictures of the graffiti 
and of course we try to understand what the uh, message and we understand very quickly it's uh, not a nice message. In June 2014, Pope Francis held a special prayer session with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and former Israeli President Shimon Peres. But the Holy See and the State of Israel soon found themselves in a minor dispute after the Vatican signed a treaty which recognized Palestine as a state. Pope Francis is known for his open and tolerant approach towards non-Christian communities. But in this case, it seems impossible to bring gestures to one side and not to step on the toes of the other. Well, let's dig into that story a little more. We're joined now from Italy via Skype by Fiamma Nierenstein, journalist and former president of the Italian Commission of Foreign Affairs. Good evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Can you tell us why it is significant at this point in time for Pope Francis to be, well, following in the historic footsteps of his predecessors and making this visit to Rome's main synagogue? Well, look, uh, this is a visit that underlines the possibility of different communities and religions to live together. This comes in a moment when uh, the tension is very high when anti-Semitism is unfortunately becoming a day-after-day subject on the newspapers and on the TV. And for sure, even if the things that were said were not particularly uh, new, uh, we can say that it is a long way that takes, that takes the two religions closer to each other. Even if, uh, of course, uh, the story is a by millennial story where a lot of blood and, and of black holes are still there. But anyhow, since Nostra Etate, uh, and then with the visit of other two popes, slowly, slowly, slowly but surely, the way, the way was paved for a better, uh, for a better relation, and uh, here it is. Well, Ms. Nierenstein, you mentioned the point about anti-Semitism, and we know that a Vatican statement just last December said Catholics should not actively seek to convert Jews and must do all they can to repel anti-Semitic tendencies. How much do you think of a role can the Vatican play in combating anti-Semitism? Well, you know, the role that Vatican can play in ideological subject is always very important. It has always been... Unfortunately, during the Second World War, the role that it played was not so positive. There is still this ongoing discussion about the attitude of Pius XII, which is a very, very sore discussion still today. And uh, so we know that if the Church has a good attitude toward the Jews, if, the, if there is a, a hand stretched toward the Jews in a, in a, in a sign of uh, friendship, of deep friendship. If the Pope keeps uh, telling the Jews that they are uh, its older brothers, well, you know, uh, it cannot be, it probably it's not a complete answer, but still it's a good sign. This is what I see. Uh, certainly, uh, there could be different things. For instance, uh, I would have liked very much to hear from him a, a memory of the fact that Jesus was a Jew. This is something that the church should repeat and repeat in front of these, in a way I would say, ridiculous attempts to deny that he was a Jew and to state, for instance, that he was Palestinian. You have certainly heard about this kind of attempt. Well, I would like all the Christians to remember that Jesus was a Jew. And uh, probably today he felt that the Jews uh, nowadays have yes. two main important points. One is Israel, and the second one is anti-Semitism. Israel from the positive point of view. Uh, the Jews of Rome and of Italy and of Europe yes. are, are <laughs> proud of Israel, you know. And so the Pope uh, should uh, should underline that somehow. Indeed, indeed. Yes, Fiamma Nierenstein joining us from Florence in Italy. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. And we're back to our Israeli studios with Natalie Ehrlich, host of I-24 News Economy magazine. Natalie, good evening. Good evening. Well, Natalie, we know that energy companies reported a huge uh, p profits uh, potentially from gas uh, offshore, right. off the coasts of right. Israel. We just what found a, potentially, they have claimed, two Israeli energy companies claim, they may have found up to nine trillion cubic feet of nat gas. Like it would have massive consequences. 
Yeah, it could definitely have massive consequences. As you know, gas is a topic that really uh, is hot here in Israel. You see a lot of Israelis debating that. Just alone in the short term, what we can expect here, Modin, which is one of the companies that claims to have found this, their stock shot at 500 percent, almost 500 percent directly off this news. So just imagine that is already a huge consequence, especially if you're an investor in that company. And that makes me curious, of course, in the long term, if this potential is realized, what could we witness? Well, I mean, we could actually see cheap gas here in Israel, which is what people have been crying about. They've been really upset about this gas deal I previously. Have. Right, especially if you use it uh, in the winter. So, uh, yeah, so I think that it could be a, a win for the public. Well, Natalie Ehrlich, our uh, host of the I-24 News Economy magazine, thank you for bringing good news tonight. It was very much needed. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. And we're staying with Israel. India's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Shushma Swaraj, arrived in Israel today for a three-day trip that will also take her to the West Bank. For decades, India's close relations with Israel were kept low profile, a situation that has changed since Prime Minister Narendra Modi assumed power in May 2014. Topping the agenda are trade and defense ties. The visit comes on the heels of one by the Indian president last October. And a follow-up on the Taiwan elections. In the wake of her landslide victory in Saturday's elections, Taiwan's new leader pledged today to maintain peace with China. For its part, Beijing called on Taipei to abandon what it described as an independence hallucination. Danny Swibel reports. Taiwan elected independence-leaning opposition leader Tsai Ing-wen as its first woman president, who could usher in a new round of uncertainty with China, the massive neighbor that claims a self-ruled island as its sacred territory. Sides have a responsibility to do their utmost to find mutually acceptable ways to interact with respect and reciprocity and ensure no provocation and no surprises. The outcome of today's elections represents the will of the Taiwanese people. The Republic of China, as a democratic country, is the root of 23 million Taiwanese people. Our democracy, national identity, and international space must be fully respected, and any suppression would undermine the stability of cross-strait relations. Some analysts say maintenance of the status quo between Taiwan and China would benefit both countries. Many of Tsai Ing-wen's reforms could not be realized without stable cross-strait relations. She will think about the strategy, like she said, of how to maintain the status quo and peace and stability. Many Beijing residents fear Tsai Ing-wen's victory in Taiwan's national elections will have a negative impact on cross-strait relations. Her view is that there are two Chinas. Does it correspond at all with the opinions of the mainland leadership? It's very different. She belongs to a different camp. But I don't see this in a good light at all, because I think all of us belong to one country. I think we should remember this. Mainland officials said the Chinese mainland will continue to uphold the 1992 consensus, reached with Taiwan and strongly opposes Taiwan's independence. And in Afghanistan, a suicide bomber killed more than a dozen in the eastern Afghan city of Jalalabad today, who had gathered to celebrate a prisoner's release from Taliban captivity. There was no immediate claim of responsibility, and a Taliban spokesman denied involvement. Islamic State claimed its first attack on a major Afghan center last week with an assault on the Pakistani consulate in Jalalabad, which killed seven people. And now to the U.S. presidential race. Hillary Clinton's campaign appears headed in the wrong direction. Just weeks before voting in the Democratic presidential primaries kicks off. Bernie Sanders has closed the gap at the national level, as well as in Iowa, and now leads in New Hampshire. In response, Clinton has taken to the offensive ahead of tonight's debate. On the Republican side, a new poll shows frontrunner Donald Trump building his lead and suggests he may be running even stronger than it seems. Yes, Donald Trump again. And I'm joined in studio by Charles Bubelezer, deputy Hi. editor of the News Today. Good evening, Charles. Good evening, Ayman. Well, Clinton's lead, I'm very sorry to say, it seems to be evaporating. It would appear that way, um, certainly at the primary level. So I'm going to differentiate be between the two. Um, over the course of the last week, a couple of polls at the national level have shown Clinton ahead by, by only single digits, and one even 
showed her ahead by only 4%. Uh, but a Wall Street Journal poll that was released uh, yesterday actually shows her ahead by 25 points. So I don't really want to get into which is right, which is not incorrect. You're, you're, it's like playing roulette, essentially. But at the primary level, it has become fairly clear that it's essentially a statistical tie between Clinton and Sanders. In New Hampshire, Sanders is clearly ahead of Clinton, and this is where he needs to win and build momentum. And if you juxtapose this campaign against the 2008 campaign, Clinton began sliding at exactly the same time, right before the Iowa caucuses, and who swooped in to win that particular state? State. I wonder who. Mr. Barack Obama. Eight years in already. Eight years later. Um, so basically, right now, it's a matter of really perception for Hillary Clinton. And it is, and the perception is that she's headed in the complete wrong direction. And she's actually going down in the polls faster than she did in 2008. It's interesting you say this is happening in the same time as the last uh, campaign that exactly. she had. So can we say this is not related to the scandals and the emails and all of that that people were worried that might damage her? It, I, I mean, there could be a certain effect, but these scandals have been in the making for a very, very long time now, and there hasn't really been a smoking gun, per se, that would really put things over the edge. It could still yet that the FBI comes and decides that they're going to indict Hillary Clinton, but I, I just really think that at this stage, Bernie Sanders has incrementally crept up on Clinton, and it seems that he's reaching some kind of critical mass, especially right before the voting, the voting. Because it's one thing for people to say, oh, I support Hillary, I support Hillary. It's another thing altogether when you have to go and actually cast a ballot. So this is why a lot of people say that prior to the primary actual voting season, the polls don't really mean as much as one would, would like them to make, for them to mean. But Moving forward, I mean, we've got two, three weeks before uh, we, we see actual ballots cast. And Charlie, I know you vowed before on this program not to mention Trump again, or at least not as much. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to tell us what's going on with Trump. A new Wall Street Journal poll shows him ahead by about 13 points, double uh, this poll that was conducted in December shows that he was up by, so he's increased by eight points. What was interesting about this one is it defied a little bit conventional wisdom because in hypothetical uh, elections against five other Republican candidates and the three front runners, he was well out ahead. So as the, uh, as the crew whittles down, Trump still looks like he's going to be very point potent. Well, Charles Bibelezer, thank you very much for being with and me I'm tonight. A, a happy birthday. I had to on air. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And we're staying actually with uh, a topic that's close to Donald Trump's heart. Muslims, with the Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump calling into question the place of Islam in America, a city in Michigan shows Muslims playing a growing role in U.S. society. Here's more. This is a sound seldom heard on American streets. Hamtramck in Michigan was the first U.S. city to approve an amplified Muslim call to prayer in a 2004 vote closely watched around the country. The city is now estimated to have a majority Muslim population, and this January there's been another U.S. first, with the swearing-in of a majority Muslim city council. The Al Isla Mosque, one of 12 here, is packed for Friday prayers, and plans are afoot to expand into the building next door. There was some local opposition to the plans and to the regular calls to prayer, but the mosque's secretary says that's all in the past. You cannot change the trend. When flood water comes, how are you going to stop it? No. But we don't have any problem here right now. We have no problem with the other ethnicity. We are, we are living peacefully together, and nobody complain about the call to prayer anymore. Bangladeshis, Yemenis, Bosnians, and others make up Hamtramck's Muslim community. Many were attracted by the factory jobs here in the home of America's car industry. But for decades, the city had a majority Polish population. St. Florian's Church is the most visible sign of this heritage. Pope John Paul II visited the city twice, and a Polish mass is still held every Sunday. Father Frankowski says the older generation in particular worry about the pace of change. Well, they're afraid that this city will totally lose its uh, very Eastern European uh, character, yes. Because there isn't that many now of uh, Polish immigrants or immigrants from Eastern Europe uh, living here in Hemtramck. This city will change. That's going to be a natural course. 
Saad al-Masmari, the newest city council member, tipped the balance for the Muslim majority. He denies as outlandish the online rumours that the new council plans to introduce Sharia law in some form. We're going to represent every single person in Hamtramck, regardless of any religion, ethnicity or, uh, or uh, colour of their skin. It's not about Muslims or non-Muslims, it's about qualification. That's it. When Polish people started moving here en masse in the early 20th century, they faced political discrimination, with electoral districts set so as to keep them out of power. As a new generation of immigrants arrives, there could be some tensions, but Hamtramck's residents seem intent on making the transition a smooth one. Yeah, shifting gears now to sports news with the host of I-24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Ragev. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, I'm on. Jonathan, I'm on the edge of my seat. The Australian Open begins tomorrow. You should be. What can I expect? More of the same, pretty much. <laughs> Novak Djokovic and Serena Williams won the title last year. Novak Djokovic and Serena Williams should be the ones winning the title this year. And yet, surprises may always happen, but the world number one men and women uh, uh, players should win it. We're saying tomorrow morning, but since it's in Melbourne, it, it, it's just about to begin. Game uh, play will begin in just about five hours at the Rod Labor Arena in uh, Melbourne. And then we see Novak Djokovic, world number one. He will take onto the court today. And uh, same for Serena Williams. Other big another big name playing today is uh, Roger Federer, number three at the moment. Uh, all, th all, all three of them should be on to the second round. It will be a major, major surprise if any one of them does not qualify to the next stage. If that happens, we'll speak about that tomorrow for sure. Doubtful, though. Well, any surprises at the Dakar rally, though? Nah. No, no surprises Stef there either. Stefan Peter Hansel, he is the man of the Dakar rally. He won this competition for the 12th time. Six times he did it on a bike, six times in a car. This 50-year-old Frenchman is just the dominant force in, in a row, though? It, no, not in a row. First time he won actually was 1991. So winning, uh, he won it when he was 26. Now he wins it when he's um, 50. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see him winning again. He's just a major, major force in this, uh, uh, this uh, competition, the Rally Dakar. Toby Price from Australia, he won on the bikes and he won for the first time. So here, yeah, there is something new, uh, at least on bikes when it comes to cars. Stefan Peter Hansen, he's the man. And Jonathan, this is my favorite part of your corner and my favorite part of the show, the crazy sports closing segment. Give it to yes, us. Yes, I, I wouldn't call it crazy a bit different, though it's something we have spoken here about uh, about the sport before. It's called foot golf and it's just as it foot sounds. Golf. Golf with a foot, pretty much that's it. <laughs> Only this time we are looking at the World Cup. Yes, there is such a thing as the World Cup, the second edition of the World Cup. This is in um, Argentina, and it, it's divided to both um, individual and team competition. Cristiano Otero from Argentina, the homeboy, he won uh, the, the title for uh, the singles competition. Team USA are the uh, big winners in the team competition. And just if, if, you, if you ask yourself how popular this sport is, so 230 players from 26 different countries participated. Sport gaining popularity. Well, I have to tell you, Jonathan, to me, foot golf looks like football. <laughs> People kicking a ball with their feet. And it has to reach a certain place. And it has to reach a certain place. We're glad you reached here, Jonathan. Of course, anytime. <laughs> Jonathan Reagan, thank you very much. We are off for a 10-minute break now for headlines from our news desk, and we'll be back.